And hi there and welcome back Math 212 students. We're going to be discussing Chapter 8, Section 2 today. These are our topics we're going to be looking at. We're going to be naming different things and uh, discussing why we've named them and how we're categorizing. It's something that you'll be teaching your um, elementary school students. Uh, first up we have Pierre and Dina and they were looking at the different stages of development of a person's understanding of geometry and they came up with several different levels first of one is the reasoning by resemblance looking at it and understanding that it, such as this square here it's a square because it looks like one you can twist it around it's still a square and um, at this particular stage though looking at something like a rhombus which is a uh, a square can be considered a rhombus but they they look at it and say oh it's no longer a square anymore because it looks a little different but we still have all four sides are the same but what has changed is the interior angles in a square the interior angles are 90 and in this rhombus notice that let's look right oops, let me get my pen out Let's look at this angle and this angle are the same. However, this angle here is much bigger and it's the same as this one over here, but and they are definitely not 90s. The next is reasoning by attributes. So um, this is a student who says uh, that that figure is not a rectangle because it's a square even though it just it really depends on your definition you have to figure out well what is the definition and understanding whether rectangles are squares or squares are rectangles and looking at those different attributes such as the attributes meaning the different sides and whether or not they're the same uh, length or looking at the angles and determining whether or not they are the same angle Another is looking at the different properties. Now this is looking at a little bit more than just um, the angles inside but also looking at diagonals whether or not uh, those diagonals bisect or they're perpendicular. We're looking at all kinds of different properties here and um, that would be reasoning by properties. Formal reasoning we can get into things such as proofs and the mathematical structure of our geometry. So if we were to think about spatial geometry and we look at this picture for one second and then go away from the picture and say draw that picture, what was it that you actually looked at? Did you look at um, whether or not these you knew that it was a square maybe inside a square or did you state that or did you say well these met at the uh, bisection point or of each of these line segments. It was exactly in the middle. Just exactly what was it you were looking at and were you able to recreate that shape. So each of these is a polygon and we need to figure out what is the definition of a polygon so that we can start classifying those polygons or really any figure. If we look at these different figures and we try to determine what do they have in common, you know, some of them don't meet in the middle, some of them make two different shapes, some of them aren't closed, some of them bend inwards, some of them are curved, and here's one that another one that doesn't meet and this one loops on itself a couple of times just exactly how are we going to classify these different shapes so we come up with definitions and we say okay let's just call everything that looks like this whether it be uh, you, you know something that has a curve to it or whether or not it has straight lines that make that shape up whether or not it's closed or not closed so that's what we're going to be discussing in this section we're going to be defining. So when you go to take your test I would definitely have, unless you're going to memorize all this stuff, which that's not my intent of this particular section, I want you to be able to classify by having your definitions close to you. So be sure and have that in an organized fashion so that whenever you take your test you're able to um, classify these different shapes 
and you're able to answer these questions by looking at your definitions. So we'll look at how to do that. So a simple curve is one that we can trace and it's just a simple curve. We can trace the figure in such a way that we never touch a point more than once. So let's look at who's simple. So we never touch a point more than once. Ah, number seven is simple because I can draw him and never touch a point more than once. Number six, simple. Draw him and never touch a point more than once. Number ten is not simple because I touch some points. So let's go back. A closed curve is one where we can trace a figure in such a way that from our starting point or ending point and they're the same. So let's go back. Which one, if I start here and I start drawing it, do I end up? Yep, so that would be a closed curve. I know I cross on myself, but in that definition didn't say I couldn't. So number two would be closed. Number three would be closed. Four is closed. Five is not closed. Six and seven not closed. Eight is closed. So let's go and see if we can a simple closed curve. Now this is one where we were a little bit sketchy on. This is one where you can draw it and you don't go over a point more than once. So your beginning and end point are the same, but I can't cross again more than once. So you are not going to be a simple closed curve. Number one, nope. Two, yes, you are a simple closed curve. Three, yes, yes. Nope, nope, nope. Yes, you're simple. No, but you're not simple, number 12, because you cross more than once. 11, simple. Simple closed. Number 8, simple closed. That is just going by the definitions. So you will need to have your definitions handy so you can figure out are these simple closed? Are they just plain simple? Polygon is a simple closed, meaning can't cross in on itself and it's only composed of line segments. You're simple closed but you're not line segments so you're not a polygon. B is a simple closed and it's only composed of line segments. You are a polygon. Polygons, we, ha we have all of these different guys here and they are all polygons. Look at the gun all in this thing here. It kind of lets you know that they are polygons, doesn't it? and this tells you the number of sides so I know they're simple closed and they have straight lines and that's what makes up these guys um, just a little side note here triangles are building blocks they're very strong we have them in a lot of structures as an example of this they had you uh, build this little thing with uh, oh, so have some sort of file folder stiff material and you make little pivot points and then they want you to see how this triangle is so much more st stable than this little guy here, much stronger. Uh, triangles, we're going to classify those, so we have to look at our definitions of how we're going to classify them. You're going to need to have those definitions beside you whenever you take your test and do your homework too. Get used to using that. If all three sides have the same length, we say it's equilateral, but equilateral sorry you are equilateral right here you're equilateral isosceles at least two sides have equal length then he's isosceles so I guess by default an equilateral triangle is an isosceles triangle because at least two of those sides have the same length so I guess this guy here would be isosceles you look like you're isosceles you're isosceles you're isosceles and equilateral scaling different sides on everybody I think this guy might be a little scaling he looks a little scaling alright right triangle uh, we have one right angle oops you're a right triangle I see you buddy obtuse has one big old angle you would be an obtuse and there are more than this here I'm just finding one and listing, listing it an acute triangle has three acute angles. You would be acute one because all of the, it's an equilateral. All of those angles I know happen to be 60 because the interior angles of a triangle add up to 180. So since all of those angles are the same, they would have to be 60. Perpendicular bisector. 
that means that we have a line it goes through the middle of our NP here our line segment NP so it's exactly in the middle and just go straight up buddy that is a perpendicular bisector so it is bisecting EN it's bisecting EN what no it's actually not bisecting it is it is segmenting EN but it's just going straight up so it's not this side and this side are equal it's not bisecting. If it's bisecting, they have to be equal, so it wouldn't be bisecting. But it is crossing through it right there. So this line MX is a perpendicular bisector because it is bisecting this PN here into halves. All right, a median is a special guy. A median is you take where you're right in the middle of a line segment and you go over to a vertex and that is called a median so a median you get in the middle exact middle let's say if I was in the exact middle of this if it was and this side and this side were exactly the same length and then I would go straight over to S and that would be considered a median now it's really cool if you take your medians and you uh, make all three medians you get this point that's called a centroid and wherever it is these medians meet and that's the center of gravity of a triangle so you could you could make this triangle draw a centroid and one thing that you do in a geometry class is fun for kids is you make this um, centroid and then you have them put their finger right there and they can balance this triangle on their finger if they make that it's kind of a fun little thing oh they tell you to put it on a nail yeah whatever we put it on our fingers um, so when we're looking at where our three perpendicular bisectors meet that's called the circumcenter and angular angular angle bisector we bisect our angle and then just we just draw it straight across so if I went in the exact middle of that angle where this and this angle were exactly the same and I drew a straight line if I were able wherever it meets over there that would be an angle bisector and here we've drawn three angle bisectors the place where they meet is called an in center so and if I were to measure the point from here to each of the sides it would be exactly the same the altitude is how tall it is straight up now a lot of the triangles you can just draw it like you know you get in the middle here you go to B and you just go st straight up so that you you're at a 90 degree here sometimes it's not quite that easy because the uh, altitude the height if you're doing the area equals one half base times height that height is what you're needing in order to compute that area so you will need to be able to do this in computing area and so you can see for this triangle his height didn't really list it if I knew this base I would need the height related to that base if I I know this base I need the height related to that and I could get that by just doing this right here so this would be a base and this would be a height or in this particular case we're looking at this base here a S that would be his base and his height would be this PT so I could compute the area either way on that and still get the correct answer the place where the three altitudes meet is called the orthocenter fun stuff here you can do with these triangles and find uh, this is where they are showing you that they found the in center the orthocenter and the centroid a cool thing to note is if you find all three of those on a triangle they will be collinear all in the same line very cool and unexpected two polygons are congruent meaning the same but we don't say that they're the same but they're congruent if all pairs of corresponding parts are congruent this means the side length and the angles.
or the corresponding angles. We could say that. Oh, they just wrote that here. Sorry about that. <laughs> and we use this symbol. We don't use an equal to unless we're talking about numbers or measurements. We'll, if, if we're just talking about that the two shapes are the same, we'll say that they are congruent. So we could look at this triangle, ACT, and triangle ODG, and we would say that they are congruent. And here is their listing telling you that they're congruent, and the measures of the angles are all the same, and the side lengths are all the same, so we can say that they're congruent. Oh, and they're telling you that two triangles, we don't really say that they're equal, we're, we're going to say that they're congruent because we're looking at uh, sides and angles and the way those things line up, uh, numerical values, and the measurements, we could say that those equal. Here's some definitions. And on the definition, it's a trapezoid is exactly this, no more, no less. You might think that it means something else, but here's his definition. So a trapezoid is defined as a quadrilateral, four sides, and it's polygon, so it's closed and it's simple, with at least one pair of parallel sides. So here we have a pair of parallel sides. It's quadri quadrilateral. It has a pair of parallel sides. It's a trapezoid. Here is a quadrilateral with a pair of parallel sides. It is a trapezoid. In addition to being a trapezoid, it is also a parallelogram because a parallelogram has opposite sides parallel. So these guys are not parallelograms. Oh, grams. But all of these guys down here, they're all trapezoids by definition. A kite is a quadrilateral four sides in which two pairs of adjacent sides are congruent. So those two sides are congruent and these two sides are congruent meaning they're the same length. It's four sides, those two sides, and those two sides. It's a kite. Let's look at this guy. Quadrilateral. This side is congruent to that side. This side's congruent to this side. He's a kite. He's also a rhombus. A rhombus has all sides are congruent. So that means all of these rhombuses are also kites rectangle, a quadrilateral in which all angles are congruent. It means that they're 90 because, well, that would be the only way for me to have because some of the interior angles here is going to be 360. So in order for them to be equal, 360 divided by 4 would be 90. And same thing with this square. But all of these squares are also rectangles because the definition of a rectangle just means that it's a quadrilateral and all the angles are congruent. All right. A characteristic of polygon with more than three sides is that they have diagonals. Now a diagonal is a line segment that joins two non-adjacent vertices. So A and B, those two vertices are adjacent, but F and B are not adjacent. So that's a diagonal. That's a diagonal. So each of these vertices has three different diagonals. They didn't sh show them all to you. Just because they didn't show them all to you doesn't mean that something wasn't a diagonal. Read that definition and try to read into it. Convex, all of these guys are convex. All of these guys are concave. So what does that mean? To me, 
concave means points inward. Somewhere it points inward. And if you look at convex, they all point outward. That's what it means inside my head to be convex. But what's the definition? Because we need something a little more than that. So for a polygon to be convex, that means that you can make a line segment connecting any two points and all of the polygonal region lies interiorly. So like if I draw a line segment from this guy to this guy, that line is not inside. Or if I draw a line from here to here, all of that line is inside. Now just because I can draw a line and it be inside, like I can draw that line, it's inside, doesn't mean that it's convex. I have to be able to do it to all of them. And I can't do it to this guy, so that means he must be concave. Now I kind of like this, if he's not convex, he's concave. So that's how you define convex and concave. And here they give you a little example. We already did that. Uh, let's see, let's look at these guys here we can talk about the different um, attributes that we know so far. We know that this guy's a kite, we know he's convex, we know that this guy over here is concave, um, we know that he's one, two, three, four, he's a quadrilateral, one, two, three, four, they're all quadrilaterals, and uh, we can classify them according to those definitions. So let's look at this guy here. Um, this is just showing me using a Venn diagram what's a rectangle, what's a rhombus, and that a square is both a rhombus and a rectangle using that Venn diagram. I kind of like this guy here. This is really useful in doing your homework. I would probably just have this little chart out. Because what this says is that anything below, so all of these things are quadrilaterals, and anything below quadrilateral that's what he is. Now quadrilaterals can be broken apart into kites and trapezoids. In trapezoids we have a couple of sides that are parallel. If all opposing sides are parallel then it's a parallelogram. But now rhombuses are also parallelograms. And rhombus is also a kite which we discussed and then we have Rectangles are also parallelograms, rectangles are also trapezoids, and rectangles are also quadrilaterals. So you can go up the chart from here. If you see a rhombus, your rhombus is also a parallelogram, he's a trapezoid, and he's a quadrilateral. Your rhombus is also a kite, and he's a quadrilateral. This will be extremely useful in doing your homework. I would have that little chart there. So does it make sense, and does it prompt new discoveries in your mind? is based totally on the definitions and what those definitions mean. And you have to read the definition and see if a shape or a polygon fits that definition. So here they're just carrying on about the different relationships among the quadrilaterals. So kite and trapezoid represent two constraints we can make. Um, we kind of went through all of this just by looking at our diagrams. They're just reinforcing that. If you're someone that likes to read through those words of that, beautiful, there they are. If not, we discuss that with our pictures. And here's another talking about the rhombus and the rectangle can be squares and, um, I mean, this actually goes the other way. Squares are both a rhombus and a rectangle. and they're writing it down again using the Venn diagram. We already did this. All right, and there are other polygons such as an octagon, hexagonal shape, um, pentagon has five sides, so not just quadrilaterals, but our quadrilaterals are def broken apart into many different shapes as we just discussed. A regular polygon is one in which all the sides have the same length and the interior angles are the same. It's what we typically think of when we think of a octagon or a hexagon. But a hexagon just needs six sides. Doesn't mean they have to be the same length. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two
five, six. That's a hexagon, but it's not regular. A regular hexagon means that all of the sides are the same. And um, a regular quadrilateral is called a square because all the sides are the same. Regular triangle is called an equilateral. That kind of drives that point home again. And a regular polygon cannot be concave, of course. Curved figures. We have circles and arcs and spirals. We can get into all different, um, we, we can classify these things in all different ways. If in your college algebra course, I know we went all over parabolas and ellipses and hyperbolas. So let's reinforce some different things about the circles because you will be going over circles with your elementary school kids. Uh, a radius CA is called a radius, that line segment CA. You could also say CB is called a radius as well. So if I were to talk about both of those, I would call them radii. The line segment AB is called the diameter. That's all the way across. Line segment XY is a chord because it goes from one side to the other. You could also say that AB is a chord because it goes all the way across, touching both sides. And the line PQ is a tangent line because it touches that circle in one place. For arcs, if I am going to describe an arc, if I said that I was going to describe AD, that arc AD, I gotta put a little arky guy over there, that means take the shortest path. If I want to take the long path, then you've got to put another point in the middle there. Here's our definitions for radius, diameter, chord, tangent, and arc. So if you want to know if something is a diameter or chord, we discussed them and drew them. Here are the formal definitions. The Cartesian coordinate system, this is if I'm graphing a couple of points. Um, and it's talking about my little xy plane where I put x on the horizontal and y on the vertical if I'm just graphing in two dimensions and I'm going to graph an ordered pair. If I'm going to graph in three dimensions, the Z comes outward and he is the third. You would do that with three digits there. Typically, we're saying that right is positive, left is negative, up is positive, down is negative. So I'm thinking of a rectangle. This is kind of like the little battleship game. Uh, there there's some really fun little, especially at Christmas time, if you do these, they, they have all sorts of plot the point and make pictures. They make Christmas trees and Rudolph and snowmen, not just something like one, two, three, five, seven, oh, that's not much of a point, seven, five, three, ten, Chink. And then they say, if I'm talking about a rectangle, where's the other guy? Well, that would have to be here at 7, 10, and plotting that point. Last, I'm going to look at the distance formula. The distance formula, here it is. You're going to have to uh, look at, let's say, we've got this point 2, 2. I've got the point 2, 2. And I want to know how far away is, let's say, 1. Five, six. So here's one point. Let's call that point x1, y1, and this point x2, y2. So if you want to know the distance between these points, people never remember this formula. I mean, once you have it, it's really nice, but they never remember this formula. But if you can remember that it's nothing more than the Pythagorean theorem, then you don't really have to memorize anything. If you can just remember that I need this distance and this distance, so that would be the distance between 6 and 2. The distance between, is that right? No, 5. Sorry, that's a 5. I, I didn't 
5 and 2. So the distance between 5 and 2 and that would be 3. In other words, the difference of my x's is what I just did. I just went 5 minus 2 and I said that was 3. And then the difference in my y's, which would be this guy right here. So the difference in my y's, which would be 4, is 3 squared plus 4 squared. And that should equal c squared. So c squared equals 9 plus 16, which is 25. Taking the square root of both sides, c would then be equal to 5. So the distance between these two points is 5 because the distance formula is really the Pythagorean theorem. Notice if I put the square on this guy and took off that square root, you would see it was c squared equals a squared plus b squared. And if you can remember that the distance formula is just a fancy way to write the Pythagorean theorem, then you don't have to remember that crazy looking formula. All right, well, that's all I have for section 8.2. I know that was a long section. I had a lot of stuff to describe. Y'all have a wonderful day, and if you have any questions, be sure and email me.